kick it off in three, two, one. We are live on a Wednesday night. I am back, back in Conyers, Georgia. And um, <laughs> there you go. That's what I like to hear. That's a little bit of cheering. I've never hurt anybody. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's good to be back and um, had a good time in West Virginia and the Lord blessed and uh, had a great service there and the homecoming. But uh, I, that was, of course, I was back this Sunday and uh, this past Sunday and enjoyed this Sunday. Man, I had a great service. I appreciate um, just this church and the encouragement. Um, my church is a little home in West Virginia. It's a little uh, country dirt road church. And, um, you know, often those kind of churches, they will shout you down. But they've gotten a little more introspective and reflective lately i mean they still amen but uh this sunday here made me feel like a preacher <laughs> so it's always good you know when the church helps you say what's good pentecostal preaching well it's only as good as the congregation i think because the congregation has to help you I remember ray hughes years ago wrote a book called pentecostal distinctives and he made the point and i actually listened to a lot of his sermon tapes as well he made the point that Pentecostal preaching is not a, a monologue, it's a dialogue. It's not a lecture, it's a conversation. And so there's that interaction. You know, I don't need anybody, you know, trying to preach it for me. I've had that happen a few times when people try to interrupt right in the middle of the sermon and carry on their own little sermon. But, but in terms of affirmation or, you know, when people respond positively to what you're saying, it's always, it always helps you. And then, of course, probably the highest, the uh, the most active, most responsive place I ever preached was the chapel services at Beulah Heights, which uh, that particular school was probably 90% African American. Man, those folks made me think I knew how to preach. They would shout me down. I mean, it was just like pandemonium. <laughs> I was like, "Woo, I can preach." <laughs> And they used to come to me, uh, and, and uh, professors, especially the African American ones, would say, "You got to have some brother in you somewhere." And I was like, "White people can't preach. I know they can't jump, but can they preach?" And, <laughs> and so when I did my DNA, I was like, "Hey, I found out I had some Nigerian." They're like, "We knew you had some blood in there somewhere." I was like, "All right." <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> it's it's all good. I just love preaching. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to pray for Sister Terry Moody. She's uh she's in the hospital. She's on some medication, um, having some uh, uh, issues with strokes, and so we just need to continue to lift her up in prayer, lift one another up in prayer. Um, I was trying to think if there's, do you remember Sister Burris in prayer, and then um, Barbara, Gloria. Gloria. Okay. Well, I didn't go today. We're going to go tomorrow. So, um, son and I are going to try to make some visits tomorrow. <clears throat> but remember these folks in prayer and then some folks that, that aren't here. I suppose a lot of them are, um, with, um, Sister Moody's family, the girls and some of them that aren't here. And, uh, let's just remember one another in prayer. Anybody have any special needs? And Brother Register. Register. Surgery coming up. Beth? Okay. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I have uh, several family members that I found out in West Virginia, brother-in-law, uh, niece, grandniece that all have some pretty serious medical issues that they've just, the doctors have just discovered and uh, need prayer as well. Well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do love you. I thank you for your tender mercies, God. We thank you that we're able to be here tonight in the name of Jesus and know, God, that you are here in the midst, God, and that you both hear and answer prayer. God, I pray tonight, Lord, for Sister Terry, Lord, in the hospital. Be with her. We pray for healing for her body. Continue to lift up Sister Burris, Gloria, and others, God, who need a touch. Lord, Blake's aunt, who, Lord, just needs a, another healing touch in her body that you would touch and strengthen her, Lord. God, for unspoken needs here tonight, you know every need, you know every situation, God. 
And Lord, you have, Lord, healing power that you purchased through the stripes on your back. So God, I pray for healing. I pray for this church. I pray, God, for our church service this Sunday. We thank you, Lord, that you're moving through our music minister. And Lord, we're excited about what our youth is going to do as we launch our youth program. So God, we just pray, God, that we will continue to have just excitement and passion and be willing, God, to be a part of something great right here at the Conyers Church of God. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, this particular um, lesson is, uh, is actually pretty short compared to the one on Jesus. The one, the article three on Jesus was the longest. It covered a lot of material. They actually break this. This one gets broken up. Four and five probably could have been combined, but they broke them into two different articles. And so number four says simply that we believe that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that repentance is commanded of God for all and necessary for forgiveness of sin. So we're going to break this down a little bit. As I said, these the gentleman, it's kind of interesting as I in our first lesson when I told you 1948 General Assembly, they wanted to come up with some uh, articles, a statement of faith, really for higher education, um, which was required in part for accrediting and to make sure our instructors were on the same page. And um, during the assembly, five, I think five gentlemen went to a hotel room together, one of the, they all gathered one of the rooms there, and then without a library, without internet, without computers, based really upon their knowledge and their understanding and memory of scripture, came up with these uh, articles of the Declaration of Faith, anticipating that it would probably be revisited and perfected, which it has not been to this day. Nevertheless, it's a solid document, and I, you know, as I say, it parallels in many ways the Apostles' Creed and other solid Christian uh, statements of faith. And this one, in particular, I, in particular, I would certainly, well, all of them, but uh, this one certainly, I think, is something that uh, every church has to come to grips with. There are some people. Who, who don't even believe in sin. <laughs> you know, it's just, you feel guilty or you feel bad. You shouldn't feel bad, you know, whatever. And, uh, but the Bible talks about something called sin. And sin is at the, at the seat of all kinds of issues in people's lives. And I think, um, a lot of what we call mental illness or gender dysphoria, a lot of this other stuff is, in fact, sin is at the heart of it. Yeah, yeah, that that that's at the heart of it. And so they try, in some cases, they'll try to medicate people to numb them up, right? And so they never deal with the root issue. They just numb themselves up instead of dealing with the real root, which is usually sin. Yeah, to escape from. Well, and you can do that, right? This social media, drinking. I did, you know, uh, drugs. Um, relationships. I mean, all of that stuff is a way to escape from looking in the mirror and saying, you know what, I have some issues. <laughs> and not just issues, I have sin in my life, right? So we need to get that out of our way. So does the Bible actually say that all have sin? Actually, it says exactly that. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 23, even the righteousness of God. Now he's talking about uh, our righteousness is no longer under the law. It's through faith and grace. And, and so he's continuing here, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. He's talking Jews or Gentiles. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whether you're Jewish, whether you're Gentile, everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so this is, you know, a fact that, that, really is at the beginning of our walk with God is coming to grips with our own sinful nature, our own sins and our need for, for forgiveness. Uh, we get a savior when we realize we need a savior. You don't call out for a savior till you know you need a savior. Uh, when you when you finally realize you're drowning, uh, you start reaching out for help, for the life buoy or something uh, to get a hold of. And so a lot of people think they're doing fine. When in reality, they're drowning in their own sins until they they can realize that and wake up. Another verse, uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, he said, as it is written. So whenever you see the, in the New Testament, as it is written, 
that person is usually referring back to an Old Testament verse of Scripture. And so it's good to go back at times and look back. And sometimes when they're quoting that, they're not quoting it word for word. They may be quoting the summarizing it or whatever. But So what Paul says here, this particular phrase, there is none righteous, no, not one, none there. It's found in two places in the Psalms. But So Paul paraphrases this as it's found in the Old Testament, saying there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. So uh, humanity, f for the most part, wasn't seeking God. God came seeking us. The Bible says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Man was running from God. They were running and hiding in, uh, you know, in the garden. They were running and hiding, and then they were trying to cover up their own nakedness with, with leaves. And in the New Testament, the Jewish people by and large, were still running and hiding. They were hiding in the temple. They were hiding behind religion. They were hiding behind the oracles of men rather than the word of God. And so there was still this hiding that was going on. Well, yeah, and it, well, certainly those that weren't uh, that weren't Jewish. Well, even the Jewish people had a tendency. If you, I'm reading the prophets now. Just finished Isaiah, and I'm in Jeremiah, and you're going to see that God reprimands Israel over and over because they just had this tendency to keep, you know, worshiping Balaam or Balak or Ash Asherah or whatever. They, they would, somehow they would begin to incorporate that into their, into their worship of Yahweh. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's referred to as syncretism where it, it infuses it and you kind of mix up all your religions together. Well, here's the question. What is sin? Well, I won't define it just yet, but I will say this. Sin is both a state and an act. It's a state of sinfulness, or we are sinners, and sin is an act. Sin is something we do. Sin, before we come to Jesus Christ, is something we are, and it was something that we did. I, I, I disagree with the, the Reformed position. Reformed theology will often you'll hear them say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I feel like that's incorrect. I feel like it should be, I was a sinner, but I am saved by grace. And they'll say, are you perfect? You're saying you never sin? I'm saying I'm not a sinner. If I sin, I still have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ, the righteous, and I can come to him because the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse from all unrighteousness. I have to ask, I have to repent, but I, I'm, I still believe uh, the Bible calls us What's the one of the most common words used for believers in the Bible? Saint, there you go. The holy ones, the sanctified ones, set apart ones. So sin is both a state and an act. As a state, we are born in sin, and every part of our being has been affected by sin. This is referred to as total depravity. It's in one of the early church fathers, I don't know if it was Augustine or who it was, but they use this phrase total depravity. And when you hear it, it doesn't mean everybody is as bad as they can possibly be. Total depravity means every part of us has been affected by sin. Our mind, our emotions, our will, all of it has been polluted to some extent by sin. Our whole being, total depravity. Again, it doesn't mean everybody is as bad as they can possibly be. It just means everybody, their entire being has been affected by sin. And that's why we need Jesus to wash away every guilty stain and make us whole again. Uh, as an act, sin is a matter of the will. Now, before salvation, Paul says we were slaves to sin. And don't you know, you're a slave to whoever you yield yourselves, body is to obey. We're a slave to sin, but after coming to faith in Christ, uh, we have a, a new will. We're given a new will. We talk, the, the terminology is like, old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. And so we, now we have we yield ourselves to Jesus, and he, as we yield to him, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. We, we do that which is right because the righteousness of Jesus has been, fancy tech theological word, the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed unto us, which means simply that, and I have it in here somewhere, it's, a, it's the next point after this, so I'll wait for that. So once we are born again, According to Paul, this is, these are his exact words, we are dead to sin. So sin doesn't rule over us. 
Does that mean we can't still be tempted and, and commit a sin? Uh, certainly, I think our experience is, yes, that can still happen. I mean, uh, but as a rule, our inclination is not to sin. I think of it this way. Before we come to Christ, the inclination is to sin. I mean, that's... The, it doesn't mean we're trying to do the bad, you know, the worst we can be. Some even sinners sometimes try to be, quote, good people. And that's the illusion, right? I'm a good person. So good people are some of the hardest people to lead to the Lord because they don't know why they need the Lord. I remember Mark Rutland talking about how he used to preach in a prison. He, he preached in this high security prison and, and he was, he said, you know, he was kind of scared to go in there. These are murderers and mass murderers and multiple murderers and uh, everything else. He said, but, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, every time I preached in a prison, someone got saved. There was always a response. He said, you know who's hard to preach to? He said, churches where you got kids sitting on the back row that have attended that church their whole life or a church their whole life. They've heard it all. They've heard every preacher. They've heard the evangelist. And they sit there with their arms crossed like, you know, what do you got? And he said, those are the hardest to reach. But the people who, are, who know they're sinners, he said, because these kids have grown up in church. They don't even remember when they weren't saved. They don't remember when they were saved, but in their mind, they don't remember when they weren't saved. Um, so, but Paul said it's a, it's a very dynamic event in that we die to sin and we're made alive in Christ. So the inclination as a believer is to do right. Sometimes we don't get it right, but we want to do right. We desire to do right. We endeavor to do right. Because we have a new nature. Well, you're trying when you want to be good, you do wrong. Oh yeah. Well, I think there's a certain extent to which we should feel bad, bad enough to repent. <laughs> yeah. But we can't let Satan tell us, "Oh, you blew it. You're done. Throw in the towel. Obviously, you can't do this." You know, as opposed to. You know, I, I know I've, I messed, but I'm not going to quit. You know, you're not defeated if you keep getting back up in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, um, how does it say it? Uh, that a righteous man may fall seven times and seven times he will arise. I, I, I don't know if that's a direct quote, but I think that's what it says. There you go. You woke me up. Sun cups. So we're saved by grace through faith, according to Ephesians. And the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. That means it's put on our account. So before we come to faith in Jesus, our account says, you know, the sin debt, guilty, 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 guilty. And but once we come by faith to the grace, then God's the righteousness of Christ gets put on our account, you know, paid, 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 paid in full. And so he pays this, the debt that we owe, and we just embrace that. We believe. I believe he did that for me. And he could, God couldn't have made it any easier for us to become believers. And so we're no longer sinners by nature because, according to Paul, we have a new nature. He uses the terminology, the old man. The old man has been crucified with Christ and no longer lives. There's a, and there was a, a thought in, in, Paul's time, and it continues in our time. So some of the Judaizers and some of the other people were reasoning, well, if sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. That's what Paul says, right? Then the more we sin, the more grace there is, right? That's the reasoning. And how does Paul respond to that? <laughs> Paul's response was, what? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Uh, Moiganoito, it's a double, double negative. No, no way. <laughs> Moiganoito, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? You're dead to sin. You can't live in sin if you're dead to sin. And so, again, that doesn't mean some of us haven't missed the mark. Um, even that, we'll look at that as the definition of sin in a moment. But the possibility of sin as an act remains because that's why John said, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he said, Beloved, these things I write unto you that you sin not. That's the standard. That's the goal. That's, that's what we're supposed to be aspiring to, that you sin not. And then he says, but, 
Some people live in the but. Uh, <laughs> these things I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. God does, you know, I want you to be perfect. And if you mess up, you thought the wrong thing, zap. Nice try. You're going to hell. No, it doesn't work that way. God's like, I still have grace. I still have grace. Don't quit. So, again, here's another concept that um, was I fleshed out, I guess I can use that word, by some of the early church fathers, the concept of original sin. You don't find that word in the Bible, but the concept comes out of, for example, original sin. Who were the first people to sin? Well, Eve listened to the serpent and partook of the fruit and disobeyed God. And then she gave it to Adam, who the Bible says was with her, which is really weird. Just like, what's Adam doing? He's like, hmm, I wonder how this is going to play out. And uh, gives it to Adam with her, although some would say it just means she, he was in the garden with her. But uh, some suggest that the Hebrew word there means he's actually in her proximity. Um, and then he to partake. And Paul clearly mentions that humanity really uh, fell through Adam. Why Adam? Well, he was created first, and God gave him the instructions. And, us, you know, whether or not God gave Eve the instructions personally as well as they walked in the cool of the day, we don't know. All we do know is that God did give Adam, for sure, the instructions not to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve disobeyed, and Adam disobeyed. So another thing that people use to... to um, to reason or to rationalize or to um, conclude that there is original sin is what David said. In David, in Psalm 51, 5, David said, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. So again, this idea, there was the first sin, the original sin, all of humanity sins. And you see this from Adam and Eve, then to Cain, Gil and Abel, and then, I mean, then all the way up to uh, Noah and then the humanity just continues to sin. And it starts with, Adam and Eve, and it gets passed on from generation. It's not a genetic defect, like you could do gene splicing and take out everybody's sin gene and we're all going to be saints. It won't work like that. It's a spiritual condition, but it is a spirit that gets handed on from generation to generation. I remember asking Dr. Arrington one time, you know, and the people that want to talk about eternal security, my reasoning is always, well, if there's such thing as eternal security, why didn't God just start with Adam and Eve? It would have saved us a whole lot of problems. Someone else said, well, why didn't he start with Satan himself, you know, before Satan fell? I don't know. But I do know God wants love to be voluntary. Love to be real has to be voluntary. And so, um, so Adam had to have the option to obey or not to obey in order to have real, genuine love. And so Dr. Arrington said, as Paul writes in Romans, that all were counted as sinful under Adam, under the first Adam so that all could be accounted as righteous under this, what I call the second Adam, talking about Jesus. Point being that because all of humanity was uh, became sinful through Adam, that way Jesus could die once, as the writer of Hebrews says, once, I think it's Hebrews, once and for all. So that Jesus doesn't have to die again for everybody that gets saved. Well, I'm getting saved, and Jesus is like, well, i got to go die again. And then my kids are, oh, how many kids you got? I got to die how many times? But because all were counted as sinful under Adam, all could be accounted, as Paul says they are, righteous through Christ. So one Adam plunges humanity into sin so that Jesus could deliver all humanity from sin. Now, all humanity doesn't accept that grace, but the power of what Jesus did is sufficient to have saved everyone. Uh, all of humanity, and certainly all of those who believe. And then in Paul's epistle, therefore, just as, oh, here's the verse, I guess I was ahead of myself. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, talking about Adam, and death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because all sin. So the idea is that everyone has sin. So, um, and I don't want to get too deep in the woods on this. What about babies or mentally ill people? Uh, the premise of this question is that uh, babies are born innocent. 
That's the premise of the question. All babies are born without sin. Does the Bible ever say that we're ever born without sin? It doesn't say that. Reformed theologians would say that they're either predestined or Calvinists. They're predestined for heaven or hell anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Some are going to heaven, some are going to hell, where they grow up and become adults or where they die as babies. That's just God's Esau, I have hated. Jacob, I have loved. They love to quote that verse from Romans um, where God makes that statement. But here's the deal. Lean not into your own understanding. It's like the whole concept of suicide. I used to be very black and white on that. You know, it's murder and you don't have time to repent. And I'm just like, I'm not a judge. I don't know. All I know is we have a just God and he's going to do what's right and, and what, but still does not violate his law. And I'll leave it with God. <laughs> All right. I don't have to make that decision. Not <laughs> That's right. And, yeah, and so even with babies, I, I, I don't, I know the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about it, except that there are some verses. Jesus said in Matthew, and this is a contemporary English Bible, said, allow the children to come to me. Don't forbid them because the kingdom of God belongs to people like these children. And he talks about their angels do always behold the face of God. He's not calling babies angels. The implication, you get that concept of guardian angel. The Jewish people believe we all had a guardian angel and that it looked just like us. Isn't that cool? Poor some of you. I feel sorry for your guardian angel. But the, uh, <laughs> I was going to say for mine, but I'm like, nah, I'm not going to say that. Uh, remember Peter when he came to the gate and he knocked and she ran back and told the people that were praying for Peter's release and they said, oh, it must be his, what? His angel, guardian angel. So that was a Jewish thought. It doesn't mean they were right, but that's common Jewish thought at that time. Anyway, um, but their angels there uh, do always behold the face of God. There's a sense in which God has a connection with infants. And so here's what I would say. If you're a parent, you should do everything you can from the time they're an infant to lead them to the Lord. And I, 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 me personally, what I believe is that there's a sense in which God lets us get to it. I can rationalize it. I can tell you God would not have held Adam and Eve guilty if he said, there's a fruit out there somewhere, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, but if you eat it, you're going to hell. I mean, that first of all, that that's not justice. God would not be a just God if he did that. So the fact that he lets them know means they had to have known what was right and what was wrong. So if we extend that, that we would think that children have to come to a point, some point, whatever that is, I don't think you can put an age on it, like 12 or 13 or whatever, some point in their life where they're able to discern between right or wrong. And I would say the same thing about mentally handicapped people as well. Are they able to discern between right or wrong? So. Um, I don't know if that answers that question. I'm just not going to take it any further. <laughs> so what is the difference? We call, and the second part of that de uh, the article is that repentance is commanded of God for all. So here's the question. What's the difference between sorrow or shame and repentance? Blake? So someone who feels sorry that they sinned, have they repented? No. A lot of people feel they sorry that they got caught. So I think I saw uh, the hand motions of Marianne. I think she probably uh, maybe is thinking about where I'm going with this. The the com Let me just, before we get to that point, um, the command to repent is found throughout the Old and New Testaments. And it's almost like God begs his people to forget, to, to repent. Like he will go down, if you read, I'm reading again, I'm reading through the Old Testament prophets now and I'm writing Sunday school lessons based on the Old Testament prophets, which is fun. Um, but it's like God lists all the stuff they've done wrong. Like the whole, most of the, of any of those books are going to be you did this, you did this, you went after the other things, you followed after the foreign nation, God, you did this, you forsook me. I mean, it goes on and on, chapter after chapter. 
And, you know, I'm going to cut you off without recourse. I'm going to eliminate you from the face of the earth. No one's ever going to know. Someone else is going to inhabit your, your land. I got it. And goes on and on. But, and then when you get down to the end of it, you know, he says, but even now, if you will repent and return to me, I will in no wise cast you out. In fact, it's one place. It's like God or the prophet or God through the prophet is begging. It's like, repent, repent. He says this. He says, Turn ye, turn ye. Why will you, you know, be judged or fall into my wrath? I forget the exact, but I just remember that. Turn ye, turn ye. And uh, so the the call to repent is prominent in the Old Testament. It's also, and I, I remember preaching through Mark, it was a message of John the Baptist. Then when John is gone from the stage, Jesus steps up and he preaches repentance. Then when he sends his disciples into the cities and villages, they preach repentance. It's repentance. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. And Paul said, as Brother Register mentioned just a minute ago, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Yeah, and part of that, and we'll come to that, is confession. So you have confession and repentance. So um, Paul, uh, Paul said, God commands all men everywhere to repent. All men. And that means men and women, by the way, in case anybody <laughs> thinks that they get an out on this. Uh, I identify um, as a man. Uh, so on the day of Pentecost, Peter told the people, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's the message, the sermon, the day of Pentecost. Repent. John the Baptist preaches repent. Jesus preaches repent. Disciples preach repent. After the day of Pentecost, repent. Repent, repent, repent. Well, the Greek, uh, biblical Greek word is metanoeo, which literally means, the literal translation is to change one's mind. Now the idea, however, is that when we change the way we think, it will change the way we act. As a man, what's it say? As a man thinketh, so is he. So when the mind has changed, and you're gonna, you're not thinking about doing wrong, you're thinking about doing right. Your mind has changed. It's a one, like in West Virginia, well, I'm sorry, Beverly. Like some people would say, I don't know why I keep saying that. It's not West Virginia, it's Alabama. They say, you're going to make a 360 degree change. <laughs> Which if you know what that is, you've come all the way. Uh, <laughs> if someone says that they've repented, but they've not changed in the way that they live or act or speak, then Jesus talks about the fruit that they bear. The fruit suggests they're just the same old tree. <laughs> so when you've, re when your mind, when you've really repented, it changes the way you think, changes the way you act, changes the way you live. So Paul says, and I, don't, I can't go back, I can't get everything on a slide, but I'm going to start verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, um, that confession, that co uh, part of uh, repentance, part of sal salvation involves two things. One is confessing, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and, uh, and I have sin, confess. And then to repent, I want to change the way that I live. And then you receive grace, forgiveness, and grace. And um, so... Let's talk about the forgiveness and is necessary for forgiveness of sins. Jesus had the power to forgive sins, but they said only God can forgive sins. But And uh, there's a couple places, one where they let the man down through the roof, and Jesus said, he didn't, before he healed him, he said, your sins are forgiven. And he set the Pharisees up. He set the people up. They were thinking, only God can forgive sin. <laughs> and he said, but that you may know. And uh, so then 
Another place was there was a woman of ill repute that came into the house not long, uh, well, when Jesus was in a house there and at, at uh, a Pharisee's house. And um, this woman comes in and starts washing Jesus' feet, if I remember right, with, with her tears and her hair. And um, Jesus asked the, the man that, that owned the house there, I think it was Simon was his name. He said, uh, you know, who who loves the most? The one who's forgiven a little or much? He said, I guess the one that's forgiven much. He said, you've rightly said, this woman who has sinned much has been forgiven much. You didn't wash my feet. But she hasn't ceased to wash my feet with her tears and her hairs from the time I came in here. And then he says, therefore, I say to you, it says to the woman, I say to you, oh, well, he tells Simon, I think it was, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Um, so there's no record of her making a public confession or asking for forgiveness or anything. Jesus saw it all in what she was doing. Those were tears of repentance that she was crying. Those was an act of repentance. Now, of course, within the Catholic Church, they turn that into something called penance. So in order to to fix your sin, you got to do penance. Not just repentance, but penance. I remember a friend of mine in the Navy, he, uh, he'd he been out in the Navy for a long, came home, and his mother, good Catholic mother, uh, at this time my friend was not, he was a uh, charismatic person, but he uh, he came home and his mother said, have you been to uh, confession? Well, you're out there, he goes, no, I'm not a ship, no, I haven't been to confession. And she says, well, we're going to the church. You're going to confession. And then tell your brother he's coming with us. And so, you know, he goes in the little booth, tell the priest your sins, comes back out. And then his, his brother goes in there. His brother, actually it was his brother that was in the Navy. My friend was in the Air Force. His brother was in the Navy. And so they're sitting out there, you know, uh, with all the chanting and the candle lighting and all that, sitting out there. And then suddenly from the booth, they heard his brother's, or he heard the priest. He heard the priest say, You did what? <laughs> you think a priest has heard a lot of stuff, right? I mean, what would it take for a priest to belt out, You did what? And his brother came out and he said to his mom and my friend, He said, You guys go ahead and go. I'm going to be here a while. Because the penance involves things like doing Hail Mary so many, do 300 Hail Marys. Hail Mother, Mother of God, you know, and then they do all that stuff. So that's penance. But we're just told to repent. So this woman came, and then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those that sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who can even forgive sin? God, well, he's God in the flesh. And says, and this is necessary. Repentance is, is commanded of all and necessary for the forgiveness of sins. Though the sinner woman did not say anything. Jesus understood her actions to be repentance and love, so he forgave her. Peter said that God raised Jesus to his right hand as Prince and Savior to give repentance and forgiveness of sin. So something we need to remember is that um, in the order of salvation, which is kind of what we're going to look at next week, the fancy word for it in Latin is ordo salutis, the order of salvation. Who takes the initiative in that? God. God takes the initiative in the order of sal salvation. God initiates salvation. He's already initiated it through the cross. But even now, who is it that convicts and convinces us of sin? Is it the preacher? It's the Holy Spirit that convinces and convicts us of sin. So God, and he works through his word, and he works through ministers, and he works, you know, but it's the Holy Spirit that t we don't, you know, you hear some people say, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to sow my wild oats now, you know, and then I'm going to, some people say, I'm going to do a deathbed confession, all this stuff. But we're not promised that. I, I've known of people who came to that deathbed moment who put off God, put off God, put off God, who got there and the preacher begged them to ask Jesus in their heart. And they say, I can't, I don't feel it. I don't feel the conviction. I you know, they have put God off. And the Bible talks about in Romans, Paul talks about men doing that which is unseemly with men. He's talking about homosexuality. I and mean, I'm not saying all homosexuals are turned over to a reprobate heart, but what Paul says is people, you can turn your back on God, turn your back on God, turn your back on God, deny his grace, 
And in a sense, what you're doing in that is you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's trying to pull you and you, you, you push him away, push him away, push him away, push him away. And as long as you reject that, you can't get saved apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't deny the Holy Spirit and reject the Holy Spirit and, and, and then say, well, I'm going to get saved. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, God is gracious toward us and he works with us, but this idea that my decision whether or not I get saved is all up to me and I'll decide when and I'll decide where and God's just going to have to deal with it. You could be setting yourself up for some serious problems along the way. I would never, you know, I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. I mean, i got to be honest. There were times in my youth where I was kind of putting it off and putting it off. But you come to these crisis points in your life where you feel like if I don't give my heart to God now, it's, it may never happen. And uh, we have to respond to that. So, uh, though the sinner woman did not say anything, Jesus, I think I repeated this slide. So without repentance, which includes confessing that we have sinned and need a Savior, there is no forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is available. You know, it's like, uh, you know, any of you that have a mortgage on your house, I have blank checks laid out here on the table, and all you got to do is come and get this check, you know, and, and fill it out. Take to believe that this is real. Take it to the bank. And uh, but the thing is, if you don't if you don't do it, you don't get it. <laughs> Forgiveness is available. The price has been paid. It's it's right there, and you just have to receive it by faith and let God's grace do the rest. Um, but see, there are some people, Carlton Pearson, remember Carlton Pearson? He was, anybody remember the singer Carmen? He was kind of an early rock. I remember listening to him thinking, should I be listening to this? <laughs> it was good music, but I still felt a little guilty growing because it wasn't Southern Gospel. I was like, can you listen to anything other than Southern Gospel and go to heaven? Um, but he was, Car Carlton Pearson was Carmen's pastor. He pastored a big church in Texas. I forget where exactly. It was a mega church. I used to watch him on TV. Anybody ever watch him on TV, Carlton Pearson? Well, somewhere along the way, Carlton Pearson got it in his head, something called um, universalism, which is basically that everybody has been saved by Jesus and that um, everybody's gone to heaven. Everybody, no matter who you, everybody's gone to heaven because Jesus died for everybody. And if that's what the Bible says, and if you don't believe that, then here's the deal. The Bible says you got to believe. You have to believe in that. You have to accept it. You have to believe. You have to confess. You have to repent. I mean, there's a there's a participation in this. And um, so Carlton Pearson, uh, he starts preaching this. It, say, what's the advantage then of being a Christian? The advantage is you get blessed in this life. You get health and wealth in this life because you believe and you practice faith and everything goes good for you. Sort of like the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the afterlife at all. But they believed the benefit, they believed in God. They believed the benefit of worshiping God was that you get blessed in this life. And then after that, it's all over. Um, well, fortunately, Carlton Pearson's church members, for the most part, knew better than that. And, and they left. They're like, oh, no, <laughs> we're not coming here every Sunday uh, and listen to this. And so his church just sadly died. I don't know what he's doing now. Um, but until we recognize the severity and shame, uh, and shame of our own sin, which is confession, and sincerely ask God to forgive us, which is repentance, then we're not ready to receive the grace that God offers us. However, we need to understand this. God no, takes no pleasure in sending people to hell. He's not standing in heaven with lightning bolts saying, go ahead, I dare you. <laughs> Just do it. Just do it. Yeah, pass that around, would you? Yeah, go ahead. And uh, So he did everything possible to save us. John 3, 16, God loved us so much, he gave his only begotten son, and if anyone believes in him, they should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did all the heavy lifting. He just says, believe. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. The argument was that Peter's addressing his people saying, where's the promise of his coming? But since the beginning, all things continue as they were from the beginning. And, and Peter's like, you misunderstand God's grace for God's indifference. God's not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, 
He's extending the period of grace so that people can respond and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, um, so the next lesson kind of continues this thought, and that's what I was saying. It's kind of interesting they didn't combine these. And this deals with the order of uh, salutis, the order of salvation, justification, regeneration, new birth, wrought by faith in the blood of Jesus. So that's where we will pick up next week. Um, so a nice short lesson. Any uh, thoughts? Pastor, this thing about uh, Christians sinning. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of this, the New Testament is forth is that we shouldn't because our lives should exemplify the fruit of the Spirit rather than the work of the flesh. Right. But I remember the winningest football coach in Alabama at this particular time. And he made the statement. He said, we don't have one play in the playbook designed to get a yard or two. Every play we've got is designed to get a touchdown. But he always had a backup case of this. <laughs> yeah. Blake? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Flowers for Brother Register. Appreciate him doing that for me. All right. Well, I'm going to say a prayer and then uh, we can go ahead. I will be down, headed, I'll uh, run to my office with this stuff and then I'll head straight down to the gym and you guys can. Uh, That's yeah, well, I think I got time. Let's dismiss. Lord, we love you. We bless your name. And I thank you for those who are here tonight. Pray, God, that we would hear this and we would respond to it. And that, God, we would live, God, humbly in your grace each day, Lord. And if, as John said, if we sin, help us never to delay, but, God, to look up to heaven and understand that your grace is sufficient. And help us to call out to you in true repentance and turn our lives, God, on a path that is a path of righteousness. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, bless you.